documentation. Um, what is there to document? Especially at the very early stage of photography, of the history of photography, uh, typically from 1839 to 1890. 1839, daguerreotype, the first daguerreotype uh, that Daguerre took outside of his window. Do you remember that one? The first clear photograph, right? Compared to Niepce's photo outside of his window in 1826, right? 1826, 1839 is at the time, the, the year uh, you need to memorize. Well, what is documentation? What is document? Well, the term documentation has come to refer to pictures taken with an intent to inform rather than to inspire or express personal feeling. It's not there to 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 offer some kind of to 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 arouse you to some kind of romantic expression of something. No, it's supposed to 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 be recording of life, of reality. And and I, I wanna give you a, a I want to remind you of a little bit of the context, very important context, that is the industrialized, the industrialization that was happening, that was heated up uh, in, in the middle of the 19th century. Right? And that is, that, that's when photography was invented, and then later, uh, as the industrialization progressed, uh, people used photography to expand the science and knowledge of the vis of the visible world, uh, especially in France, especially in the what we call the uh, housemanization, the re the demolition and then rebuilding, almost rebuilding of the of the entire city of Paris. Enlarged the role a lot of the the very grandiose, the very large uh, projects, city projects were underway during this time. And photography right, and photograph was used for the first time to document this process, or if you like, this progress of the city, of the modernization of the city that was happening at the time in Paris. So uh, I want you to, well, I want to ask that question with you uh, throughout this, as we are going through this uh, slide. I want to remind you of one question. That is, is it documentation, photography, right? Just taking a picture of things, right? Is it a passive, pure recording of life, of the world, of the reality? Or is it a way, a creative a new way, because it's new technology, so it's a new way of accessing the world. Remember John Berger's this ways of seeing, there are so many ways of seeing the world. Is our way of seeing the world through this documentation, in this, in this case, photography, right? uh, uh, photographs, series of photographs, is it really a reflection of the world? Or is photography an active, a proactive way of creating a narrative, of telling you this is how we should understand these events? If that is the case, then it gets very uh, complicated because people can manipulate photography can manipulate the way you take photograph, how you take it, what to be included and what to exclude, right? And offer you a kind of world that serves their intention. The government wants to use it, a different kind of, for their own personal, different people for their own personal benefits would manipulate photography of, of photographs as well. And let's explore that today. Uh, but uh, so first we we wanna look we wanna look at 
how the documentation of landscape and the documentation of events and objects. Uh, but for landscape, um, so first we want to start with landscape. And uh, for landscape, I want to remind you that the interest in landscape, in capturing the landscape, uh, is not new. Its photography was new in the 19th century, but the interest in that is not new. But it's just a way to, of capturing the landscape that's different. Painting, the most common way before photography came along, was, it was painting that, that uh, you know, people painted the landscape. Uh, and there was even a, a, a period, a movement, a movement for that, that it's uh, romanticism. That that was uh, that started during the Enlightenment. That that uh, that artists or philosophers they celebrated uh, through text and visual painting, celebrated the power of reason, uh, celebrated special. Um, oh, excuse me, the philosophers right during the Enlightenment they celebrated the power of reason, but to the opposite it was it was romantic romanticism that followed the, the celebration of the reason that is the celebration of the emotion right that is kind of like uh, um, to balance that that uh that ex, ex, uh, extreme extreme uh, uh pursuit of reasoning right there you need to have something to balance it that's romanticism that came after the enlightenment to celebrate emotional express uh, emotional expression Right, follow your heart, or how the the grand the grandeur the 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 um, power of your heart of your of emotion. The champion the human liberty, right? Celebrate the nature, the rural life, the rural life, but right? not so much of the intellectual reasoning, right? And then out of the romanticism, and there is this uh, what we call the sublime, the pursuit of the sublime. That is what well, which is we can understand it as the sublime. It's a it's a pursuit of how landscape can be and should be reflected. All right as part of the branch of romanticism right because in romanticism you can express all kinds of emotions through different contents through different kind of subjects and landscape being one of them but how do you express your emotion through landscapes how about to how about through the aesthetics of sublime how about to to focus to amplify that passion of irrational is compared to rational, the very rational reasoning in enlightenment. Sublime, this is the uh, focuses on the irrational exerts of powerful and awesome force on people. How the nature is, is so, is much greater, much more um, uh, omni powerful than people. Celebration of the sublime, the grandeur of nature. Let me give you an example. Uh, this is a celebration of the sublime, of the grandeur, of the violent, of the extreme expressive uh, power of nature in the middle of the storm, the slave ship by J.M.W. Turner, by this artist who's known for his work to express the aesthetics of sublime right the, the slave ship was turned upside down the slaves and uh, as well as other goods on the ship and uh, were uh, in the sea in the swirl of the sea in the swirl of the storm you see the fish the waves very vile and the light coming through this foggy this waves. The nature is so powerful that in front of it, we human, we look so uh, tiny, first of all, in terms of the size, and second, so 
trivial, so not important, so close to nothing, so vulnerable. The contrast between the nature and human. To express that feeling of grandeur, of sublime, and that is how people were interested in nature at the beginning. And then photography came along. So, for example, this uh, photography partners Southworth and Haas they. Worked together, nineteen years of partnership to photograph the the natural uh, uh, monuments, the natural uh, scenes, the famous uh, the, the natural scenes across the United States. And then it was these scenes that, after their photographing, after their photographing them, became uh, became famous and became uh, visited by. Uh, you know, more and more tourists. People started to get to know these places because of the sublime that they that transpire in them. So the question comes: What did photos like these contribute to society? How did they function? Who, if these photographs were ever purchased, who typically purchased landscape photography? Who are the intended audience? The general public, right? Congress declared the first national park in the world at Yellowstone in eighteen seventy two. Due to the photos, such as these ones, the Niagara Falls, these ones, the, the Congress declared national parks. So, what's the function of this landscape photography? National identity, the 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 admiration, the re recognition of nature. And through the nature, through this land, in 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 the case of U.S., through the U.S. land and Yellowstone, Niagara Falls, while、well, our country ha has so many、uh, magnificent places, natural resources, we should love it. We should love this country. This is part of our our identity. We love this country because of this, uh, it, it, because it's beautiful. Simply. And broadcasting, promoting photos or images of these natural resources, natural scenes, help to bolster that identity, which the government would certainly love. It's like some kind of patriotic, patriotic ed education, didactic education that you should love your,、uh, your, your nation, your country. It's no different in this light. It's no different than, like national anthem, like the national flag. What do you think? Would you agree with me? How about events? How about this photograph? What's the scene? A sad, a happy scene. Where people are joining hands in the middle. What's the focus of this photograph? I I suppose it's 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 in the middle because all the lines, all the vantage point, right? The for the composition of the photographs tells you, right? One train on this end, and the other train on the on the right, and then people this line, uh, all drawing. Your attention to the middle, where these two engineers or the 
or whoever the, the you know or the directors of the railroad transcontinental project railroad project they are shaking hands joining hands and then on top of them right as we follow the vantage point to a bit further then we see the champagne cheering the champagne Uh, this it's a celebratory occasion that workers focus on a lot of workers that posing in front of the camera uh, there are some uh dignitaries there's some other workers who were who's been working on the railroad for so long and finally after so many years the east and the west the transcontinental railroad they met at one point the last rail were placed at this time, at this place, where, where, where is this place? Meeting, that's a title, Meeting of the Rails at Promontory Point, Utah, in 1869. Right after the Civil War. It's important to not to, to, to join Right, the east and west, the north and south, to unite all the states, all the people together as one nation. Joining hands of the east and the west is important to to advocate, to to inform people in the east where they were heavily populated, populated compared to the West, pretty desolate in the West, right? Uh, to uh, ask the people in the West to, to, to inform them the West, the beauty of the West, to go and explore in the West, which is also part of this nation. And now the transcontinental railroad is completed. They can travel. You should use this railroad, railroad, right? Like a promotion, like an ad, to to travel to the west to explore the west. A little bit of the background for you: the the Union Pacific Railroad Company. They they hired Andrew J. Russell, the artist, the f- uh, photographer, who who has the experience of uh, photographing the war in the Civil War. But now, after the, at the end of the war, uh, Russell was hired by this company to document the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, creating a visual document. Right. His job is to create a document. I'm reading off of the, my notes on the, uh, on the PDF that, that you can uh, pull up uh, as you're watching the lecture. <clears throat> so the documents, the, the the contract says that calculated to to interest all classes of people, and to excite the admiration of all reflecting minds, as the colossal grandeur of the agricultural, the mineral, and commercial resources of the West are brought to view. To promote the West, the, the the West, so that again, so that people will use this rail to explore the West. So for about two years, following the celebrated driving of the last spike at Promontory's uh, summit, um, uh, the spike you can see in uh, the Stanford uh, Cantor Museum, uh, still the golden spike uh, that that's placed in there as a as a ritualistic kind of a celebratory uh, a ritual because the you know uh, leading the the stanford um is is the, the the sponsor who invested a lot in this uh transcontinental railroad um so russell photographed the west and along the railroad the construction of the railroad for two years and up until the the eighteen sixty nine, and uh, and after that, eighteen sixty nine, he continued to photograph the areas around the railroad and began to write dispatches 
about the West for Eastern newspapers. After he returned to New York, he would maintain a photography studio there and never traveled west again. Russell has his boss, and his boss won this and won all the photographs and as well as the news to be to be seen by the eastern, the people living in the east coast. So there is a intended audience in there. It's not the general public. There's the intention behind this photograph. This is, there's the identity. This is the symbolic meaning behind this joining of the hands, celebrating with the champagne, with this vantage point, the triangular vantage point, all full, all pointing to the middle, emphasizing this sense of joining hands, of uniting. The power of photography, the power of photograph, is it a reflection of a of the of the reality? It's a reflection of a lot of the intentions of how people think、uh, of the context. Along with many other things, right? It's a reflection of the complexity that's that's hidden behind the scene. Photography as documentation. It's not as simple. It's not as simple as pure, unbiased, docu-、uh, a recording of things. It's more than recording of things. You see, people are looking at the camera, right? Because at the time, still the exposure time is long, and the the processing processing、uh, process is complicated. You need to keep the glass wet. Uh, you put it in the box, the dark box, and then you have to develop the the image, the the, the plate on the site. You know, with the dark room, you usually you you might have a caravan, a wagon that uh uh in in、uh, like um、uh, in built in uh to uh be. Into uh, the uh, what the dark room, right? You have you have to have the dark room on the site, so you have to transport the dark room on the site, and it it takes many assistants to 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 take one photograph. And then again, camera documentation. How how does camera document then events or objects? Well, again, I want to remind you again. It's during the in the midst of the industrial、uh, revolution, the industrialization of the、uh, entire Europe. So, photographs were used at first to document those,、uh, you know, things that's related to the industrialization a lot. For example,、uh, every year there's a、uh, this exposition, the global. Uh, excluding well, but mainly in the Europe,、uh, industrialized、uh, exposition fairs every year、uh, to for、uh, each country to show the technology advancement, to show things for the, their own country, to advocate for their own country、uh, in the exposition to the world. So, for example, in eighteen fifty one, there's this famous building, the Crystal Palace in London. Uh, the Great Exposition.、Uh, many countries came exhibit、uh, to to participate in the exhibit in the building of this Crystal Palace. It's in itself a a a a, a champion of the industrial the 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 result of the industri- industrial revolution because it's the use of glass, tempered glass, the use of A、uh, glass to build、uh, a a a huge construction project. A to build a space. That's for the first time to use these many glasses and in many shapes, in many angles. So by itself is this, you know the building by itself is already a celebration of the 
industry of evolution of the new technology and the new technologies of course photography being one of them um, and then photography was used to capture the building right in the, the this uh, exciting result coming out of the industrialization the glasses the the places to make people in awe about the era that they live in to make people feel that oh i'm really stepping into the modern era with all these technology technological advancement another example would be a photo of workmen constructing the statue of liberty in the studio uh, in the workshop before you know it was shipped to New York, right? But the French government gave the United States the Statue of Liberty as a gift. And uh, this is a scene showing the construction of the Statue of Liberty by Albert Fernick. <clears throat> this is another way of documenting the scene, the humongous size of the statue and the small figures in the front. Again, they're all posing because it takes three to 20 seconds uh, of exposure time. So they have to pose it. And the scene inevitably is manipulated in a certain way. It's not <clears throat> entirely, it, it's set, well, basically it's set up, the photograph is set up. What can you see from this contrast, huge contrast between the huge statue and the small human being? It promoted, right? This image is like this, already promoted this project, the Statue of Liberty, as some kind of grandeur as some kind of construct some kind of construction some kind of project that we should be proud of that we human being as as uh, nihilists or as uh, small as we are we're able to build big projects that's a whole focus of the industrial revolution we built big cities uh, uh, built big projects how about documentation of the war what would it, what would it be like but i want to remind you one thing that is uh first of all uh, the documentation of the war didn't become feasible until the Claudian era, which we mentioned in the last in, in the last module. Uh, because it has to be more portable than transporting this whole dark room to the to the war zone, uh, transporting all the all, all the equipment to the war zone, that's not feasible. So you have to wait till the Claudian era. You have the negative. You have to uh, to develop the pot. You can wait till you go back to the dark room to develop the positive and the Claudian, making the print, the the developing the plate more uh, portable, so that you we can transport it across different war zones, across different uh, uh, battlefields. And another thing I want to remind you is that in the 1850s and 60s, photography was an extremely deliberate process. I want to remind you that sometimes the war, the reflection of the war might not be so uh, at the moment. It's more of, uh, you know, sometimes you see progs like a gun at, at the side, see different objects being move, moved around, the soldiers might pose. To be dead or shooting, uh, to 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 reach a certain uh, planning, 
before capturing the photograph. It's not what we <clears throat> what we might think as naturalistic as realistic. For example, uh, well, first of all, the Crimea, the the Crimean War was actually the first war to be photographed, and Roger Fenton was hired by the British government, the British Army. To photograph in this war, and you can and and uh, you can go to your textbook to read some kind of scandalous uh, uh, anecdote about why Fenton was hired to, by the by the army to photograph. Where there's some kind of intention uh, behind it, that photograph because you know uh, the army was reported, right? But the news reported the army. Uh, uh, didn't treat the, 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 their soldiers well in the front line, and there's some kind of uh, arguments, conflict in the front line, and they really, you know, that really hurt the reputation of the army. And the army wants to Fenton to go into this war, the battlefield, and 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 take pictures and uh, uh, and provide to them this evidence, right? Visual evidence. That the soldiers in the front line, the British soldiers in the front line, they're very, they're very united. They are in good shape, and to, to to in response to this kind of a bad rumor. In of course, in service of their own interest, the interests of the British army. And there is this photo. This is you see this uh, landscape. It's free of people, free, free of soldier. It's in the war. It's in the battlefield. We people might assume, oh, we we're gonna see people fighting, shooting each other, and or maybe uh, dead bodies lying on the war uh, on on the ground. But you just see all these cannonballs inhabited the entire uh, landscape. Valley of the shadow, valley of the shadow of death. Just photographing the object as a way to, to reveal the cruelty of war, of the battle, and and people nowadays still debating if Fenton put the cannonball there before he photographs. So this is totally a setup, or is it really that many cannonballs on his way to to you know in on his way to somewhere? That's Fenton's photographic van. This is the dark room that he carried. You see the many equipment. That he utilized many assistants, cameras, seven hundred glass plates in the in this wagon, in this photographic van. Took him four months to take three hundred sixty images. It's pr 